Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks so much for being here today for our webinar presentation. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're right at 10 o'clock. Uh, so my name is Amy Jewett. I am the Pennsylvania IMAP Invasives Program Coordinator at the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And I am pleased to be joined by our guest speakers, Jocelyn Beam and Peyton Phillips. Uh, I'll be introducing them here in just a moment. I do want to mention um, that throughout our uh, presentation today, there is a Q&A feature enabled on the webinar. So if you have any questions about any of the content that we're going to be talking about today, feel free to type in that question in the Q&A at any time. And then we will take some time at the very end to go through and answer those questions um, and then answer any other questions that might come in at the very end also. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and get started by introducing our speakers, uh, and then we'll get the presentation um, going. So our first uh, speaker, Dr. Jocelyn Beam, grew up in southeastern Pennsylvania and graduated with a bachelor's degree in environmental science from Drexel University. She then left Pennsylvania for graduate school at the University of Wisconsin and a postdoctoral fellowship at the Free University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Through her education, she has researched invasive species in Canada, China, Guam, Hawaii, and the Caribbean. Following her education, she returned to Pennsylvania and is now an assistant professor in the biology department at Temple University in Philadelphia, where she runs the Integrative Ecology Lab and studies the impacts of invasive species in Pennsylvania. And our second guest presenter today is Peyton Phillips. Peyton grew up in Virginia and attended the College of William and Mary, where she majored in biology and environmental science. She obtained her master's degree from Central Michigan University, where she studied the genetic impacts of plague in black-footed ferrets. She is currently a graduate candidate at Temple University, working under the guidance of Dr. Jocelyn Beam with a focus on Lyme disease ecology. So thank you both for being here. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Jocelyn, to get us started. Great. Thanks so much for that introduction, Amy. We're really excited to talk to you about our research today. Um, so yeah, Peyton's going to advance my slides. So I will be saying next slide throughout. So I'm ready to go. Next slide, Peyton. Okay, so I'm guessing if you're here watching our webinar, you know a little bit about invasive species, you've been hearing about it, but just so we're all on the same page, this is the definition of invasive species that we use. So it's a species that's been spread to a new area where it causes environmental, economic, and or human and animal health impacts. So you probably know about some. Okay, next slide. And you maybe have been hearing more and more about invasive species, and that's because there are more and more of them. So this is a graph from a study where they looked at the number of invasive species that have been introduced to new locations or new countries over time, starting back to the 1500s. So they were able to get records from then, probably before most of us were around. But as you can see, the pattern shows there's a few invaders in the, the past, but really species invasions ramped up in the last century. And of course, these data only go to the year 2000, but that trend has continued this century as well. Okay, next slide. You also, if you live in the United States, you might be hearing more and more about them because you live in a hot spot for species invasions. So this is a map from that same study um, that shows the number of invasive plant species per country. Countries that are shaded in red have more invasive species. Greens and blues have fewer, and you can see the United States is dark red, tons of invasive plant species. And so we're a hotspot for invasive plant species, but lots of other species too. Uh, next slide. So this is true for birds, insects, lots of other animal groups too. So yeah, no shortage of species that are invasive in our country. Okay, next slide. You might know about, um, some widespread dramatic invasive species that have really dramatic impacts. So I've got three here that you might know about. So kudzu vines, which can blanket an entire forest and smother it out. Uh, zebra mussels, which are quite prominent in the Great Lakes region and are spreading throughout watersheds there and outward that can blanket a, a lake bottom and lake shores. And then the emerald ash borer, which is here in Pennsylvania where I am, um, they 
can kill trees and cause widespread tree death and uh, really change the structure of a forest. Okay, next slide. Even recently, those incredibly devastating fires in Maui, um, one reason they were so bad is due to invasive grasses. So the, the ecosystems in Hawaii are not fire adapted, meaning they don't have species that regularly burn. These invasive grasses that have been introduced proliferate in the rainy season and then die in the dry season and then have um, leave these big bunches of dead grass biomass that is great kindling for fire. And so when fires were started in Maui, then these grasses just ignited and really contributed to the devastation that happened. So I showed you these really dramatic, horrible impact to invasive species in some cases, right, that cause really obvious changes, but not all invasive species do that. So some species, in fact, most of them create changes that are much more subtle, uh, much like taking a little piece out of a Jenga. It doesn't really change much to an ecosystem, um, but if you get enough of these subtle changes accumulating, it can really trigger dramatic consequences. Okay, next slide. And so this is a system that we study, um, invasive plants and Lyme disease. So this is kind of one of those Jenga systems where we get a bunch of impacts that might cause dramatic consequences. Okay, so you've probably heard about Lyme disease, but again, so we're on the same page. Um, next slide. I have a, a diagram of Lyme disease ecology, which um, Lyme disease might not seem on its surface like an ecological problem that ecologists like Peyton and I might study, but it is very ecologically based. So Lyme disease is caused by a spirochete bacteria caused, uh, called Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, if we go to the, the left side of the diagram, uh, ticks are the vectors of this bacteria. They hatch and uh, they start out as larvae and then they metamorph into nymphs. And when they're born, they don't have the bacteria, which is really important. They acquire it by feeding on a vertebrate host that has the bacteria in infected hosts, such as um, rodents. And animals that carry the bacteria vary in their capacity to transmit it back to tick or transmit it to ticks. So this is called the reservoir capacity. So some animals are really good reservoirs, meaning if a tick feeds on that animal, there's a really good chance the tick's gonna get the bacteria. Other animals might still have that bacteria, but if a tick feeds on it, the tick's not going to get the bacteria. So rodents there are really good reservoirs shown on the left side. Okay, so if a tick feeds on them, especially um, a nymph will pick up that bacteria, it's infected, and then every subsequent host that that tick feeds on has a chance of getting infected by, from that bacteria, the tick will pass it on. So like that hiker, um, the nymph metamorphoses into an adult, still carries the bacteria with it, and then we'll feed again as an adult on another host, like another hiker or another host like a deer up in the top. So deer are important into Lyme disease ecology, but they often get um, misidentified as being good reservoirs, that ticks, that deer are, are reservoirs for Lyme disease, which isn't really the case. They're not good reservoirs, but ticks do feed on them, so they are important to Lyme disease ecology. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Okay, next slide. Okay, so Lyme disease has been documented um, across the United States. So here's a map showing the incidence of cases across the U.S., but you can see it is really concentrated in the northeastern U.S. and the upper Midwest in those areas. And it's an expensive disease. It costs the U.S. nearly a billion dollars annually to treat these diagnosed cases of Lyme disease. And this is important because a lot of cases of Lyme disease are undiagnosed and people can get it without knowing it and have symptoms and are sick for a while, which also accu uh, accumulates a lot of costs. So it is expensive. So it's worth trying to figure out how we can mitigate it. Okay, next slide. So our work, we're looking at the links between invasive plants and Lyme disease, and invasive plants in particular we're interested in are understory plants. So these are the plants that live in an understory of a forest. So I have two photos here, an invaded forest on the left and an uninvaded forest on the right. And they're certainly similar, but you can see in the invaded forest, the understory level is quite dense. 
So there's a lot of vegetation there. And this is what these understory invasive plants do. They're often shrubs, they overgrow, they form these dense uh, thickets of vegetation that's structurally quite different from the uninvaded forest where you can see there's a lot more space between the plants. Okay, next slide. So I'm gonna go through um, a bunch of the different actors in the Lyme disease ecology system and how invasive plants are subtly pushing those different actors in different directions to get to this Jenga moment of Lyme disease outbreaks that cause lots of Lyme disease in forests. So the first one we're gonna look at is the direct relationship between invasive plants and ticks. Okay, next slide. So the ticks that we mostly focus on are the black-legged tick, also called deer ticks. These are the main vectors of Lyme disease. Here you can see the three life stages, the larva, nymph, and the adult next to a dime. They are tiny, which is one of the reasons people might not know they have Lyme disease because you might not see a tiny little tick like this on you. Okay, next. So in terms of the role of invasive plants here, the thinking is that invasive plants create ideal habitats for ticks. And studies have shown this, that in invaded forests, those invasive understory plants that are very dense, they create these cooler, more humid microclimates that are really nice for ticks because ticks are susceptible to desiccation and drying out. So they like it to be cooler and humid. In an uninvaded forest where the vegetation is a little less dense, it's not the best for ticks. Um, so next, they, um, so they're not very common in these uninvaded forests. They're certainly there, but just not as abundant. They need these, these nice, cool, humid microclimates. So they tend to be just more abundant in invaded forests. Okay, next. The next part of the relationship we're gonna look at is the reservoir, the, um, the rodents in the system. Okay, next slide. So yeah, um, the rodent that we're particularly interested in is white-footed mice. So these are a fantastic reservoir for Lyme disease bacteria, meaning ticks that feed on them have a really high chance of picking up the bacteria from the mice. And next slide. The, um, just like ticks like the habitat provided by invaded invasive plants, my, mice like it too. So the, um, the invasive plants create this cooler, more humid environment, which can be nice. A lot of these invasive plants also provide fruits. And so there's little snacks there for the mice, which is also a nice place to be if you're a mouse. The uninvaded forest might be hotter, less humid, less snacks. So there's fewer mice there again. Okay, next slide. So putting this together with the ticks and the mice, if you've got a location that's drawing in more ticks and also drawing in more mice, Together, if they're both there, that's just going to increase the chances that ticks and mice are going to encounter each other and that ticks are going to be feeding on mice instead of another less competent reservoir. And so that's going to increase uh, Lyme disease infection rates in ticks. The next component we're going to focus on um, is the predators in the system. Okay, next slide. So the main predators, um, there's several species that predate mice. Um, we're really interested in foxes, red foxes. Um, so again, if you think about the invasive plants, they create these dense thickets. It's really hard, if a mouse is in there, it's really hard for a fox to get in there and get the mice because there's just too much vegetation in the way because um, it is it can be quite dense. So studies have shown that invasive plants can create these predator-free environments that are fun havens for mice to, to hang out in because there's no predators, increases mouse populations so we get more mice that way as well. Okay, next. And then the final part we're gonna look at is the deer, the deer part of the equation and how invasive plants help them. The deer we're interested in in our area are white-tailed deer. Again, they're a poor reservoir for Lyme disease bacteria, but we are interested in them. And just like, um, Mice like the invaded forest because it's cooler, more humid, more snacks. Deer want to get in on that snack action too, potentially, and eat invasive plants. So invasive plants um, can attract more deer to the, that location. And so again, in an uninvaded forest, there might be fewer deer. And so studies have shown again that, that there might be more deer in invaded forests. And the reason this is significant, next slide, yeah, is that 
even though deer are poor reservoirs, they are big and they can feed a lot of ticks and increase tick populations. So here we've got two gross pictures. Uh, on the left is a deer full of ticks. We've got on the right is a mouse with some ticks. And you can just imagine, um, so in a mouse, they have pretty thick fur and, and ticks can really only attach kind of around their eyes and around their um, ears and where the fur is, is much thinner. So there's not a lot of places for ticks to attach on a mouse. Deer on the other hand, is like a free buffet for ticks. So even though deer are not good reservoirs, they really can serve to increase tick populations because they feed a lot of ticks and um, are a great meal for ticks. Okay, next slide. So these are all the components. And again, like the Jenga, um, each one of these uh, links for, with these arrows is kind of a subtle change. And looking at an ecosystem from the outside, it's not like kudzu where invasive plants are blanketing the forest. It's more of a subtle change, like invasive plants are just causing deer to linger in a location a bit longer so that ticks can get to them or keeping foxes out a little bit more than they normally would be and helping mice populations to get a little bigger, right? And so doing each of these pieces um, can in and of itself increase Lyme disease, but together we can have kind of that Jenga moment. If we think about this in terms of Lyme disease pathogens, next slide. Remember the pathogen is coming from the reservoir, so from the mouse going up to the tick. And then why we care about this for people is that the more and more ticks that get infected, the worse it is for people going out into a forest to go hiking or, or in their yard or, or coming in encounter with ticks, right? The more ticks that are infected, the more likelihood people are going to get Lyme disease. Okay, next slide. So in thinking about this, um, each of the pieces that I showed you, there is there have been studies that have provided support for each of those pieces happening in different systems. But no one's looked at all of those pieces together in the same system, in the same location, to see how each of those are interacting together and how they can really contribute to these Lyme disease outbreaks, which is what our research is doing. And what we do in my lab and my PhD student, Peyton Phillips, is leading this research. So I'm gonna pass it over to her and she's gonna tell you about her really cool work that she's doing in this system. All right, thanks for, the, for setting us up so nicely. Um, I'm going to walk everyone through my dissertation research. I'm just going to give you sort of a broad outline and then I'll go through each of the parts um, that Jocelyn kind of outlined in that diagram. I'll go through each of those in more detail. So my dissertation research looks at Lyme disease ecology um, around Philadelphia and some of the surrounding counties. So this is a map. Each of these red points is one of our study sites. We have um, 20 forested sites um, and within each of those forested sites, we have a paired setup. So we have um, one survey plot in an invaded section of the forest and one survey plot in an area with sort of less of those um, dense invasive plants that we're gonna talk about. At each of these plots, we performed tick drags to collect ticks um, and tested those ticks for pathogens. We used camera traps to survey the medium to large bodied mammal community to get at those predators and deer. And finally, we used track plates to get an idea of sort of the small mammal community and how they're using that habitat. So first I'm gonna focus in on this um, relationship between the invasive plants and the ticks that Jocelyn described. So in order to really look at this, um, I performed vegetation surveys at each of my sites. Um, I used this method where I kind of walked in a straight line um, and kind of set this pole down and then categorized all the plants that touched the pole at different heights so that we could get an idea of vegetation structure. Um, because one of our hypotheses is that the structure of the vegetation is what really matters. I usually, or I, for the most part, I looked at broad vegetation categories such as herbaceous or shrub, but we did look at three specific invasive plant species that I'm going to tell you about today. Um, and we also noted the presence of other things such as leaf litter. Um, ticks really love to burrow down into the leaf litter. Uh, it kind of helps prevent them from desiccating, from drying out. And we also noted the presence of woody debris like logs and things because mice really enjoy those. 
So the invasive plant species that we really focused on in our research, um, there's three of them. So they're all shrubby, um, thicket forming plants. So the first one that I was really looking for was Japanese barberry. So Japanese barberry is from East Asia, um, but it is pr uh, present throughout a lot of the United States and Canada at this point. Japanese barberry forms these dense understory thicket types um, of vegetation. In the summer, it's a bright green color. The leaves are sort of teardrop shape. They can be sort of irregularly sized, but the, the leaf shape is pretty distinctive. So it's relatively easy to identify. You may have seen Japanese barberry um, kind of lining your neighbor's lawns. It's a really popular landscaping plant. In the fall, it'll turn this bright red color and it gets these red berries. So it's quite pretty. Um, people you know, have liked it for quite a while as a kind of functional landscaping plant. Um, it just unfortunately will spread beyond those lawns and overtake the entire forest floor, as you can see in this picture. In my plots, this was not the most common invader. We didn't have a ton of Japanese barberry, but we did have some plots where it was um, quite prevalent. The reason we were interested in Japanese barberry is because there's a large body of literature that shows um, that Japanese barberry can have a really big impact in the Lyme disease system. So it provides that favorable habitat for ticks. Um, the humidity is higher, it keeps a good temperature that will prevent the ticks from drying out. So ticks really like to kind of hang out underneath the Japanese barberry. Um, and in forest where you have Japanese barberry stands, um, you have a higher abundance of those ticks. You also have a higher abundance of mice those mice have more ticks on them. And so then you have more infected ticks. So there's a large body of research kind of supporting all of these relationships. We were also interested in multiflora rose. So again, multiflora rose is another plant from East Asia. Um, it has spread kind of across the United States at this point. And again, it's very pretty, people like it. Um, it has these lovely little white flowers um, in May and early June. Um, so it's a great sort of escaped landscaping type of plant. Um, unfortunately, when it gets into the forests, it grows incredibly dense and widespread thickets. Um, you can see here, this is all multiflora rose. It gets very, very tall. The individual kind of shoots of the plant will kind of reach up into any patch of sunlight. I have been in parts of the forest where it was well above my head. Um, and it also has really large thorns. So you're walking out in the forest trying to do your vegetation surveys and these giant thorns are just ripping your clothes and scratching your skin. Um, and I imagine that if I were a deer or a fox, I would not want to hang out in this area. <laughs> um, so there is some research on the effects of multiflora rose in the Lyme disease system. There's not quite as extensive research as there is for Japanese barberry, but there has been um, evidence of sort of higher abundances of ticks directly underneath the plants and evidence that those ticks have higher Lyme disease prevalence. The final plant that we wanted to focus on is wineberry. So wineberry is another East Asian invader. Um, this one was very, very common in my study site. So we ended up focusing a lot on this wineberry plant. It grows in a sort of similar structure to Japanese barberry and multiflora rose. So you do get these sort of thickets on the understory. Um, it can sort of grow in more of a loose structure um, depending on the site conditions, but it's related to raspberry. So you get these sort of broad flat leaves um, the stems have like a reddish color and they're very sort of hairy. Um, these aren't quite as thorny as like multiflora rose, but the, the little hairs are kind of grippy and uncomfortable. Um, throughout the summer, the plant develops these bright red berries. They are edible for both um, humans and wildlife. So um, on our camera traps, we caught things like a lot of birds eating these, um, these fruits. Um, I saw some uh, Eastern box turtles eating these, um, and there's lots of evidence from the literature of things like raccoons and um, other species, you know, enjoying these delicious berries. So those are the three plant species that we kind of focus in on, and when I talk about invasive plant species, 
it's these dense structure or these dense thicket forming structures. While we were out surveying all these invasive plant species, we worked with um, Amy to uh, upload all of our observations to IMAP invasives. Um, we, yeah, sorry, um, we wanted to contribute to this sort of shared data initiative. Our lab uses a lot of large data sets and um, shared publicly collected data, um, for instance, to study spotted lanternfly. Um, so we wanted to sort of contribute our observations of these invasive species to IMAP invasives. Um, and we would encourage you to do the same. Um, this, for instance, is the records that IMAP Invasive has for Wineberry and um, just in Pennsylvania. And you can notice that there's a lot of local municipalities where it says Wineberry isn't present, but we're willing to bet that it is. So um, the more people that are out there contributing to these types of data sets, the better coverage um, we'll have. So the better management um, and the better research we can all do. So now that we know what our invasive plants are and we've kind of surveyed all of those plants, we need to know what ticks we have. So to survey ticks, um, I and some lucky undergraduate students got to go into the field and do tick drags. Tick drags um, are really low tech. They're very easy to do. Um, basically, we took some PVC pipe, uh, duct taped a one meter square white cloth to it, and then just drag it along the ground. So you walk at a slow pace, like you're in a wedding, you know, you step, pause, step, pause, and you do this for a certain distance. And then you'll pick the drag up and carefully inspect the cloth to look for these tiny, tiny little ticks. Um, we were surveying when nymphs were um, that sort of middle life stage when they were mostly out. So they're very, very small and you have to kind of strain your eyes a little bit. But the reason this works is because ticks kind of sit there and do that questing thing. They're just sitting on the end of a, um, like a leaf or something, reaching their arms out, waving it around, waiting for a host to walk by, and they mistake the cloth for a mammal and they grab right on. So we can take them back to the lab and identify them. And when we were in the lab, we were looking mainly for these five tick species. There are others, but they're sort of specialist tick species like that only prey on rabbits and we don't really see them. Um, so these are the ones that we thought we might be getting. I'm going to go through each of these species. So the first one that we were obviously targeting was the black-legged tick. So this is the one that Jocelyn mentioned is responsible for Lyme disease. So black-legged ticks are kind of associated with deciduous forests. Um, that's the habitat that my research occurred in because we were interested in Lyme disease. Um, they feed on a wide variety of vertebrate hosts. So any sort of mammal, any they feed on birds. Um, there's a lot of research from the South that they feed on lizards. So any sort of vertebrate they will take a blood meal from. And unfortunately they transmit not only Lyme disease, but babesiosis, anaplasmosis, relapsing fever-like diseases, mycoplasmosis, bartonellosis, and the Powassan virus. So these are not a, you know, a species that you want to end up with, you know, attached to you. Um, these ticks are, they're kind of, they're very small. They have sort of a teardrop-shaped body. Um, the males and the, the adult males and females look a bit different, um, but they're pretty easy to identify. We were mostly targeting the nymphs, and I'm just going to show you a little example of how difficult it can be to find a nymph. Um, this is a picture from the CDC that really grossed everyone out, so they had to remove it from their Twitter. Um, this is a poppy seed muffin. And you can see, so like right here, we have a poppy seed, and then these five are nymphs. So that's how small the ticks are that we were looking for, and that that is how small you need to be focusing when you are checking your body after a hike, because um, they're very easy to miss. The second species that we encountered during our surveys was the American dog tick. So these are typically associated with areas of sort of lower tree cover, but we did end up finding them at our sites. They also feed on a huge variety of vertebrate hosts and they are responsible for transmitting tularemia, ehrlichiosis, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. They're a bit bigger than the black-legged tick um, and they have kind of this pretty distinctive coloration. So they're pretty easy to identify. Um, and since they are bigger, you can usually, especially the adults, um, 
they're you typically notice them crawling on you, um, but still the nymphs and the larvae are tiny, so definitely check yourself thoroughly. Um, during some initial kind of pilot surveys, we also found a couple of brown dog ticks. Um, these are mostly associated with human settlements and they really prefer to feed on dogs and sometimes other mammals. Um, and they do transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, we didn't end up finding many of these in our main surveys, um, but they can be present in the area. So all three tick species that I just talked about are native to this region. We did find two species that are um, more introduced um, recently. So the first one is the Lone Star Tick. So this species is native to the United States, but is primarily found in the Southeast. Um, but it's been expanding its range northward in the last decade or so. This species is associated with woodlands. It again feeds on a variety of vertebrate hosts. However, it's a little bit different in that it will actively seek out hosts. So instead of just sitting there waiting for something to walk by, it will go after things. So not the uh, most appealing thought. Um, it transmits ehrlichiosis, again, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, tularemia, and sorry, but what really has people freaked out and what upsets people the most when I talk about ticks is that it can give you a red meat allergy. So it can bite you and cause your body to sort of react to red meat when you try to eat it. So that's a scary thought for people who love their steaks. This ticks is pretty easy to identify compared to the others. Um, it the female especially has this bright white dot in the middle of its back. That's where it gets the Lone Star name. The male doesn't have that, but they do have sort of a rounded body compared to the other tick species. So if you kind of know what to look for, you can you can spot them. But again, still very tiny, um, you know, something to keep an eye out for. The final tick species that we um, encountered in our surveys was the Asian longhorn tick. This is a brand new invader from East Asia. It's found a lot in China and Korea. Um, in, in Asia, it's mostly associated with sort of pastures and livestock. People think of it a lot as being um, associated with like sheep. However, in the US, we're finding it a lot in forests and sort of edge habitat. And we're finding it on a ton of different hosts, so not just associated with livestock. In Asia, this tick transmits a huge variety of pathogens, like dozens of different pathogens. Um, but it's a little unclear if it's going to play a similar role in the United States. It clearly has the ability to transmit those pathogens, but there haven't been any records thus far of it transmitting pathogens to humans. So here's the summary of the five species that I just outlined for you. These two in green are the native ticks that we ended up surveying. We didn't really see much of the brown dog tick. Um, and then we did survey these two that are shown in brown. Those are our um, sort of invasive tick species are introduced. Um, I have the black-legged tick and the Asian longhorn tick outlined in these black boxes because those are the two species that we ended up um, testing for pathogens. So this graph just shows you um, sort of the distribution of these two species between our invaded and uninvaded paired plots. Um, and you can see that for the most part, we saw um, higher abundances of these ticks in the invaded plot. So in that dense understory, which is sort of what we were expecting. So we have our black-legged tick, in the dark green. Um, we didn't encounter too many American dog ticks, so pretty low abundances of those. Um, and then our lone star tick, again, you're seeing much higher abundance in the invaded habitat and much higher abundance of Asian longhorn ticks in the invaded habitats. This graph is just showing you mean abundance. Um, and you know, it's like maybe eight per little plot that we did. Um, but I want to point out to you that the max abundances were much higher. So um, the black-legged tick, the most we found in a pot was 30. The most we found of American dog ticks was only four. Again, they're not associated with forested habitats. But in one single plot, 
I collected 154 Lone Star ticks and 164 Asian um, Asian Longhorn ticks. So those are both from the same survey. Um, these huge, huge densities of these ticks. So, um, especially with their host-seeking behavior, this is something that you know you might want to watch out for certain patches of the forest um, and be ready to peel them off with duct tape or something. <laughs> Uh, keep your dogs close by to you. <laughs> so if we go back to our sort of conceptual diagram that Jocelyn outlined for us, um, if, when we look at invasive plants and ticks, we does seem like we're seeing higher abundances in the invaded habitat. So the next step was to figure out, you know, what pathogens are we actually seeing in these ticks? Um, and we did this in collaboration with the Tick Research Lab of Pennsylvania, um, which is at East Stroudsburg University. So they um, are a really great program. They have the resources um, from the government that if you are a resident of Pennsylvania and you find a tick attached to you, so you go hiking, you walk your dog, you come back and you're like, oh my gosh, there's a tick on me. You can take that tick and you can mail it to them and they will test it for you for free. So they will, they have certain pathogens they'll test it for. Um, and they'll say, okay, you've been exposed to Lyme disease. So you can go to your doctor and tell them like, I have definitely, I was bitten by a tick that had Lyme disease. Um, if you're not a resident of Pennsylvania, um, you can still send them the, your ticks, but you have to pay for the, um, for the pathogen testing. Uh, but they're a great resource. So we worked with them um, since they already had these panels set up to test for these different pathogens. We worked with them to send them our black-legged ticks and we ended up sending them our Asian longhorn ticks. So focusing in on that black-legged tick since it's the one that carries Lyme disease, um, we tested um, for three different pathogens. So the first one we looked at was anaplasmosis. This is a bacteria that infects your white blood cells, gives you flu-like symptoms for the most part. We also had them test for babesiosis. This invades and ruptures your red blood cells. So you get those flu-like symptoms, but you also get blood clots and low blood pressure. And obviously we had them test for Lyme disease. So um, Lyme disease infects many parts of your body. Um, you, get, you can get a bullseye type rash um, at the site of the tick bite. You can get flu-like symptoms, and for some people, you can get really long-term impacts with a huge variety of symptoms. Um, and you can see that um, the density of, so we only sent them nymphs just because that's sort of um, recognized as sort of the most risky life stage. You know, they've already fed on a host. They're really small, so people tend to miss them when they're doing a tick check. So we sent nymphs for testing. Um, and you can see for each of the pathogens that there was slightly higher um, infection prevalence in the invaded plot. For some of the species, it's not a huge difference, um, but it seems like there may be a, a little bit of a relationship going on here. And so if we think back to our sort of conceptual diagram, it seems like we have higher abundances of ticks in the invaded habitat and that, you know, they may also be more infected um, than in the other habitat. So I had a um, great undergraduate student helping me um, and he sort of took the initiative to um, work on his own sort of senior project. And um, since we had collected all of these hundreds of Asian longhorn ticks, and since they're sort of a new um, introduced species, we decided to um, ask, you know, are they infected with pathogens in our region? Like, is this something we need to be worried about? Um, and so we worked with East Stroudsburg again to um, test them for the same sort of three pathogens that we tested our black-legged ticks for, um, but also to look at two other pathogens. So they tested for Ehrlichia. This invades your white blood cells. Um, you can get joint muscle pains and also Rickettsia, um, which can cause um, fever, nausea, um, blood vessel damage, that sort of thing. Thankfully, this is good news for everyone, um, wasn't necessarily as interesting for Jackson um, as he was working on his project, but for everyone else, it's good news. Um, of the 207 nymphs that we sent them for testing, none of them tested positive for any pathogens. So um, at least in our little region of southeastern Pennsylvania, um, we didn't collect any Asian longhorn ticks that might, you know, be out there transmitting disease to you. All right, so if we go back to our conceptual diagram, we're thinking about Lyme disease. 
The next part that Jocelyn outlined for you was this relationship with the small mammals. So in the literature, it looked like, you know, they seem to enjoy this invaded habitat, but what are we seeing in our system? So I have those trail cameras out that I mentioned, and while we can occasionally get photos of small little things like mice, they're not very reliable. They're kind of flukes. So instead, we used track plates. So um, these are just like little metal sheets and then um, take some kind of transparency film, like if you use an overhead projector and your teacher like kind of writes on it, like that's the same sort of film. I painted it with a graphite solution. So the same stuff that comes out of your pencils. Um, and then whenever we place them just on the ground on the forest floor and whenever a mammal runs across it, it leaves little scratch marks or footprints. Um, and so you can kind of see here, um, these are the sort of tracks that we end up with. Um, so it, this is like an animal that ran across. And so it left some little scratches from its fingers. Um, as you might guess, this is hard to identify, like specifically down to the species. So we kind of just ended up categorizing things as small mammals. So something that's like a chipmunk mouse shrew vole. Um, and this gives us an idea of how much those little small mammals are using the habitat. How active are they? Um, and you can see there doesn't seem to be a huge difference between our invaded and uninvaded plots, but it seems like we have slightly higher activity in those invaded plots, which would be what we were expecting. So again, we can fill in this diagram and say, okay, maybe the invaded plants are, as we expected, supporting higher small mammal activity. I do want to note an interesting sort of side avenue that we looked at. So um, we had the opportunity to do a small subset of small mammal trapping. Um, and with the help of some undergraduate students, we took body size and morphological measurements. Um, this was led um, by an undergraduate student named Gianna Basala, and she's writing up a paper on our findings. But the interesting finding for us is that at sites where there are invaded, these invaded shrubs present, so the Japanese barberry, wineberry, and multiflora rose, at those sites, we have the more invaded species, the more invaded shrubs you have present, the larger the mice are. So in areas where we had two or three of those um, shrubs present, the mice were not only longer, but they weighed more. And this is interesting because if you have larger mice, you have a larger surface area. Um, and so you may have more opportunities for tick attachment, which could have um, you know, downstream consequences for Lyme disease transmission. All right, so the last or so the next part of our diagram is looking at those predator relationships. So we want to know um, how the invasive species, um, the invasive shrubs are influencing how those predators, such as foxes, use the habitat. We surveyed these large bodied species um, or these medium bodied species using camera traps. So this is a motion triggered camera and hunters use them a lot. Um, so we just attached it to a tree. Anytime an animal walks by, it takes a picture. Um, this is, you know, some of my undergraduates helping me set these up out in the forest. And we caught a large variety of species. We ended up having the cameras out for about a year and a half, and we got over half a million photos, which is a lot of work to go through. We used the platform Wildlife Insights to help with that. Um, and, you know, we got some small things like um, Eastern chipmunks, a lot of deer, over 176,000 photos of deer, a lot of raccoons, squirrels, red foxes, um, occasionally things like skunks, possums, and coyotes. So a, a large variation. For the foxes, um, we indeed saw the relationship that we were expecting where there were fewer um, sort of foxes in those invaded habitats compared to the uninvaded habitat. So it seems like it might be sort of restricting their access to those small mammal um, prey items. Um, so less predators in the invaded habitat. Does this have an influence on how the, um, on you know, the predators influencing those small mammals, that part of the relationship is coming soon, so stay tuned. Um, the next part of the diagram that we're looking at is the, um, the deer. 
Again, we surveyed those with the same camera traps, same exact setup. And interestingly, in our system, it seems like the deer may be avoiding those invaded habitats, perhaps due to the structure of the invaded plants. Um, so we saw more deer in the uninvaded habitat. So an interesting sort of unexpected negative relationship here and how that sort of directly feeds into the path of, you know, tick infection and tick prevalence is something that we're um, analyzing. So the next steps, our future directions are putting this all together. You know, we have each of these little individual pieces of this sort of Jenga game that Jocelyn was talking about. But what happens when all of this sort of combines? You know, which of these relationships, which of these parts of the path are the most important and the most influential when it comes to understanding um, tick infection and the downstream consequences of that for us, for humans? Because that's, you know, why we ultimately care about this research is, you know, people want to know when I go into the woods, am I going to get Lyme disease and how do I avoid that? So that's kind of the next step is putting all this together um, to sort of answer those questions. So I'd love to thank the many, many, many people that um, made this research possible. I had dozens of undergraduates help with field data collection, laboratory analyses, um, identifying those half a million photos. Um, Dr. Rob Clathenot Temple let us use his lab space for DNA extraction for the ticks. And these are all of our many land partners, the people who allowed us access to the sites and helped us pick the sites and plots. Um, they've all been instrumental in this research. And with that, um, we will take any questions that anyone might have. All right, well, thank you both. That was incredibly interesting. Um, I know a little bit about some of your research that you're doing already, but just to be able to go more into detail on all the work that you're doing was super interesting and kudos to all the time and effort that you've put into this. Um, so thank you for such a great presentation. Um, so we did have several questions come in as you were talking and I'll take them um, in the order that they were received. And then if we get some additional ones, folks can feel free to go ahead and type in any other questions that you do have. Um, so the first question is from Dora. She is asking, do all animals host ticks such as groundhogs? Yeah, so it seems like, yeah, ticks will pretty much feed on anything. Um, the, I think it's the CDC, it's not the CDC, there's a, one of the government organizations maintains this like giant list, especially for the Asian longhorn tick, because they're so interested in it right now, of all the species it's been found on, and it's just an insane variety. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Uh, we had another question early on in your presentation. There was a map of the Lyme disease reports. Um, so we had a question from Pamela asking, it's crazy how Massachusetts is not lit up on that map. Is it just not reported there? Yeah, I don't think they have like a Lyme disease force field around them. I think it's just <laughs> data reporting, which is, yeah, kind of disappointing and very obvious when you look at that map, it's kind of striking, but yeah, I'm, I know it's there. So I think it's just reporting. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, we had another question from Erin. Um, she's asking, interesting, I always thought that a healthy forest had lots of understory plants, but are you saying forests that don't have that understory is the one that's uninvaded? Yeah, I think we, um, so my sites had a pretty wide range. So some of my sites had basically no understory, but then a lot of them that were sort of in the uninvaded category, they do have understory. It's just not quite the same. It's not these like dense, um, you know, shrubby type plants. It's more things like spice bush, like native spice bush, which is a shrub, but it grows a lot taller. Um, and so the forest floor itself still has a lot more openings, a lot more space for leaf litter, um, but not, it isn't just like entirely covered like a lot of these invasives will. They'll just kind of go in and completely cover the forest floor. Right. Great. Thank you for clarifying that, Peyton. We had another question from someone. They're asking, deer generally don't eat invasive plants, so why are they attracted to invaded forests? Yeah, there is certainly mixed data on this. Um, and right, if, if deer were really attracted to invasive plants, 
invasive plants wouldn't be a problem, right? Because deer would be eating them. So um, part of the reason that we have so many is that, you know, deer aren't eating all of them or to the extent that they're they're growing. But there's certain parts like wineberry, we, you know, has these nice juicy berries on it that are attractive to a lot of species. So I we think, and there's data out there showing that deer are attracted to at least some parts of invasive plants that might cause the deer to linger for a bit in the area where there's more ticks. Um, and then there's new studies coming out that they are, it's not a blanket avoidance of all invasive plants. There are actually some invasive plants that they do like. There's some data showing that they do like multiflora rose, at least in some places. And maybe it's, if there's nothing else available and that's all they've got that they will eat it. Um, so yeah, it's, it, there is variation there, but yeah, there's data all over the place. So there are certainly some places that they do avoid. Okay. And the other Great. thing I'd add Thank to you that is, I was just going to say that Go the ahead. other thing um, to think about is that for some species, it's not just about the food. Um, these plants do, you know, provide these dense structures, which for some species might be useful if you want to kind of bed down and have a little bit of cover, especially in human sort of dominated areas. If you can kind of get behind a wall of invasive plants and not have to worry about a human like startling you or, you know, coming upon you when you're sleeping or eating or whatever, then that can be appealing. Great, thank you for that. Um, we had a question from Susan. She's asking what native plants are safe to use in mixed hedges to defend property lines. Um, and she's mentioning some scientific names here that I had to look up just to make sure I knew what they were referring to. Uh, Aurelia spinosa, which is devil's walking stick. Ilex opaca, which is American holly. Blackberry, Ribes mississauriensi, which is Missouri gooseberry and other brambles. So again, what native plants are safe, quote unquote safe, to use in these mixed hedges to defend property lines? Yeah, I mean, I think that's always a challenge that we're trying to figure out what we can put in our yards to make good wildlife friendly habitat, right? And everybody has different definitions of what's native and what's native to this region and all that. Um, I tend to go to Penn State Extension. They have some good resources on that because it also kind of depends on what you want in your yard like do you want something thorny like holly might be great but maybe you know you want something with more color or flowers or th things or thorns or no thorns or things like that so I tend to go to those resources um Doug Tallamy from the University of Delaware also has some great resources on what plants for different you know if you want trees shrubs you know herbaceous vegetation what are good native species that attract different species and things like that so that's what I tend to go to when I'm thinking about landscaping in my yard. But yeah, it is a challenge. But technically, yeah, I mean, we think if it's native, sorry, pain to interrupt. Um, if it's native, it shouldn't be a problem. And if it does escape, that's okay, because it shouldn't cause a problem. Okay, I'll shut up. Go ahead, Nate. Peyton. No, no, I was gonna say, yeah. And that's like part of what we're trying to figure out with our research is, you know, in my final dissertation, we want to look at sort of the quantitative structure of the vegetation to try and figure out like okay is it just these plants like these invasive plants or is it really like a certain structure of plant that you know you could apply also to native plants or you know kind of what is the most important thing here so that's sort of part of our ongoing research seems like there's a lot of ongoing research she has one question <laughs> then five more questions to answer after that <laughs> um great thank you um, another um, kind of interesting question from Joanna. What is your favorite way to avoid going home with ticks? Um, yeah, tick checks. Just every time you go out, just check your whole body. It's tedious, um, but that's really the only way. Um, I've seen some really cool stuff where people will like wrap their boots or their socks in like reverse duct tape so the sticky side is out. And that seems to also help. Um, a little bit, but I always go out in long pants. I tuck my socks in or my pants into my socks. Um, I treated my clothes with permethrin, which you can order off of Amazon. Um, but really it's just those tick checks, like, you know, um, in the particularly dense plot where I had all of those Asian longhorn and Lone Star ticks, I scraped them off with a credit card because there are too many. So get creative, but do the tick check. 
And I would imagine wearing lighter colored clothing is also going to work to your favor. So you can make it a little easier to see those sticks. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we had some other questions um, from Ed. Um, he had several questions all together. So I'll, I'll read them and then we can go through one by one um, to make sure we don't forget anything. So he's asking, how dense is a deer population in the regions surrounding your test sites? Do the uninvaded plots have a sparse understory because of overbrowsing by deer? Did any of your uninvaded plots have a dense understory and did they have high mouse and tick population densities? So I can repeat any of that if that's helpful or if you got everything, then that's fine too. Um, yeah, I'll go through and then if I forget something, let me know. Sure. Um, I don't have exact numbers on the dense population in like the region surrounding our site, but it is high. It's very high. Um, the Our camera traps, we got, like I said, like 176,000 pictures of deer. Um, they were present at all of our sites in high numbers. Um, deer tend to like sort of those suburban forest fragments, um, which a lot of our sites are kind of in this sort of suburban matrix, but even in our sites, like in Philadelphia, we had huge populations of deer. So lots of deer. Um, in terms of the uninvaded plots, um, if they had a sparse understory because of overbrowsing by deer, I'm not 100% sure. Um, in certain spots, it seemed like it was um, potentially a matter of like soil um, or light conditions. So the these invaded plants grow really, really well when there's um, sort of a break in the canopy cover. So if a tree comes down, that sort of spot will be filled in um, by the invaded plants or they'll grow sort of near the edges of the forest where there's a lot of light. Um, so in parts of my forest where I had more of a complete canopy, we had um, a little more of that sparse understory. Um, and then if the uninvaded plots, um, so yeah, some of my under, some of my uninvaded plots, they, I wouldn't say they had the same like dense understory of like this, like you can barely even move um, like some of the invaded plots, but some of them did have a higher content of like spice bush where there would be more total plants around. Um, and did they have a high mouse and tick population densities? Um, some of them still had pretty high tick population densities, um, especially if there was a lot of leaf litter. So if you don't have those invaded shrubs, but you have a thick leaf litter layer, um, the ticks can still get that protection. Um, and in terms of the mice, it varied um, kind of depending on what was available for their habitat, for their, for their use. Like if there was a lot of downed wood, then you might still have a lot of those. Um, so yeah, that's why we kind of want to look at those sort of quantitative measures of, it, of the vegetation a little bit more. Great, thank you. I think you got everything there, wonderful. Yeah. Um, let's see, Elizabeth is asking, what's the process for mailing a tick to ESU? Is it on their website and is there a form involved? Yeah, yeah, if you go to their website, it's like Tick Lab of Pennsylvania, you just search it in Google, it'll take you straight there, and they have like a button that's like, send us your tick, so it's very easy. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Brooke is asking, did you include larvae in the total ticks collected? Yeah, so in that graph um, that I showed, like the bar graph that showed total ticks, that one did have larvae. Um, we only sent nymphs for testing, um, and we didn't have too many larvae just based on the time of year that we were surveying. It was mostly nymphs. Okay, thank you. Um, question from Lori. Um, she's asking, will this recording be shared with participants? Um, yes, if anyone, if you've registered for this webinar, even if folks aren't on today live, um, or if you are, uh, we will be sending out a link to this recording a little bit later. So you can stay tuned for that and share it out with others. Uh, let's see, a question from Keith. Any indication of behavioral avoidance of track plates? Um, we left the plates out for three consecutive days so that hopefully they'd have time to sort of get acclimated. Um, it didn't seem like they were avoiding them. We got tracks on a large number of our plates. Um, and it was pretty consistent across site. So it didn't seem like there was, you know, a particular area where they might've been avoiding them or anything like that. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, and then we're kind of running a little short on time, so we'll try to get through at least uh, one or two more questions. Um, a question from Stephanie. Was there a particular area of the state where you found the Asian tick? What were the median uh, amounts of other tick populations? Um, yeah, so we only surveyed in um, Philadelphia, Delaware, Chester, Bucks, and Montgomery counties, like in southeastern Pennsylvania, and we found it in all of the counties that we surveyed. It wasn't at every single site, but we did find it kind of throughout the region. Um, and the median amounts of other tick populations is that, I assume that's just like for the different species that we surveyed. Um, I don't know if I have the medians off the top of my head. Um, the means were, you know, like around eight or so ticks, um, but the American dog tick was much lower, um, but I don't have the medians off the top of my head. Okay, and we'll have time for at least one more question um, from Celeste. She's asking, is there a way to account for individual medium bodied mammals? Um, in essence, to be sure you are not counting the same fox returning to a spot day after day. Yeah, so we, we looked at like activity. So even if it is the same fox coming back, um, we still want to know that because each time he's coming through that area, he could be picking up ticks. Um, we did account for like detection. So we grouped photos that were taken, you know, like within 15 minutes of each other. So if it's the same fox, just like running zigzag circles around in front of my camera, we're not like, oh, there's hundreds of foxes. Um, but we still do want to know even if it's like the same fox, just because ticks Ticks will keep on biting. Right, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, I know there's several other questions that came through in the Q&A, and unfortunately, we don't have time to go through and answer all of them. So I would encourage you, if your question did not get answered on the live session today, uh, Jocelyn and Peyton do have their contact information listed here um, on the presentation. So please feel free to reach out to them, and they will be happy to uh, answer your question uh, at a little bit later time. Uh, so again, thank you both, Jocelyn and Peyton. This was amazing, super interesting, and really great research. Um, so appreciate your time. And again, I'll be sending out a link to the recording later so everyone has a chance to look at that again if you'd like to. So thanks all, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks for hosting us, Amy. Sure thing. <laughs>